Okay, I'm Willie Hassel, director of Chase's Paranormal. We are one of the producers of today's festival, and we're really happy to see everybody come out and join us and support the paranormal and support the uh, Hilldale Cemetery. And our next speaker, uh, we've actually only known him for a few months, but uh, he's, a really, he's a really great guy, I can tell you that. He's been on our, our radio show uh, two times now, right, Ronnie? And on the TV show once. He's, uh, he's had a lifelong interest in cryptozoology, science, and things of the strange, he says. He's the author of the book Monsterland Encounters with UFOs, Bigfoot, and Orange Orbs which is centered on the history of Bigfoot and UFOs in Massachusetts, especially in the Lemons to Mass State Forest, which uh, the section of the forest is called Monsterland, which is where the name of the book came from. So let's welcome Ronnie LeBlanc. Hey guys. Can I take this out? So um, I'm Ryan LeBlanc. I wrote the book called Monsterland, which is a little section in Lemonster that people have seen some weird stuff, UFOs, Bigfoots, orange orbs. Um, and so I kind of got into this. I was a, a kid. I always had an interest in this kind of subject, uh, but didn't expect things to kind of get a, a little out of hand uh, once I started working on doing some research and working on the book. So I'm basically going to cover a couple of things. I'm going to give you an idea of, of Monsterland, which is in Lemonster, Massachusetts, where I'm from. Uh, there was Bigfoot tracks uh, that were found back in 2010. And that's where a lot of uh, the impetus for this thing to really start going as more stories started coming out once uh, that story hit the papers and was on Finding Bigfoot as well. So we'll cover a few of the local encounters as well as orange orbs, which people are starting to see a lot more of now. So for over 400 years, people have been seeing tall, human-like, hairy creatures walking around on two legs. This is not a new phenomenon. It's been happening for a long time, and it's been happening all over North America. The question I have is, the question I have is, <laughs> why would almost every Native American tribe have a name for this creature if it's not real. These are just some of the different names. Wild Man of the Woods, Stick Indian, Evil God of the Woods, Devil of the Forest, the Cannibal Demon, the Bushman, the Woodman, the Giants. So there's a reason for this. Here's a map of the sightings in North America. This goes back 92 years. 3,300 reports throughout the U.S. and basically in all the major populated areas. But what's interesting, if you go to the BFRO.net, which is the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization website, there's over 12,000. Those are reported. So think of the amount of sightings and encounters or finds that don't even go reported. People don't want to talk about it because you're crazy is the uh, answer people will give you. And it's not just in North America, it's all over the world. These are the different names all over the globe for the same type of creature. Some different sizes, some different colors, and, and even some are considered to look like a dog, a dog man. Lemonster State Forest is uh, an area that encompasses five towns, and we'll give a little brief history on this, but this is where a lot of the different sightings have occurred in the woods. Um, People that have gone there not looking for anything have encountered things like this. Uh, police officers as well. You guys might know Lemonster from this guy, Johnny Appleseed. He was born in Lemonster. His grave site is in Lemonster. Um, so there's a history of the area. Lemonster was part of the Underground Railroad. Um, so there's been pretty much all the different ghost hunting shows have been to Lemonster. Uh, with different haunted houses, um, but it has a long history as well with the Native Americans. It used to be considered some sacred land in that area as well. Lemonster State Forest was mentioned as well as Monsterland in Lauren Coleman's book, Monsters of Massachusetts. Uh, he runs, as you know, the International Cryptozoology Museum. He's uh, an author. He, his, one of his books, Mysterious America, was one of the first books I read 
that really got me into the whole cryptozoology piece. Um, but as I started delving more into this and researching, it seems to be that we're not dealing with an animal. There's something else that's kind of going on. So Lovester State Forest is, is uh, 4,500 acres. It's five cities. It's huge. Uh, there are tons of places for something to hide. There's water source. There's tons of game. It's a, a great environment. And Lemister is in north central Massachusetts, so it's right pretty close to the New Hampshire border. An interesting trail that runs through Lemister State Forest is the Mid State Trail. It's 92 miles. So it's been proposed that um, if there is a creature being seen in this part of Massachusetts, it's possible that they're migrating through up and down through this type of trail. So Monsterland, which is now kind of got its name back in the 50s, and I'll explain that story, but it's located in South Lemonster, it's along the Lancaster border. It's an area that the locals have named it. And it goes back to um, the sand dunes and people would go four-wheeling, ride dirt bikes. Kids would go there and do parties. Um, couples, teenagers would go parking there. And they always reported either sightings of strange lights, of craft, flying saucers, flying over the area, people seeing Bigfoot type creatures, hearing weird noises, seeing weird things. And this is indicative of all the other places like this across the country that are some portal areas or hot spots have the same type of phenomena that's happening. So give me an idea, Lemister State Forest abuts Monsterland. What connects them all is the power lines. And I'll talk about my experience with the city of Lemister in the center there. Uh, but what's interesting is Fort Devens is right here. Most of the hot spots across the country, there's a military base close by. So that's an element here that we're dealing with. Uh, Fort Devens was um, basically the base was intelligence. So they were training spies. Um, and it's very close proximity. There's been sightings over Fort Devens by the military of these orange orbs. And I'll mention that and talk about that in a little bit. But how I kind of got into all of this was when I was about 10 years old, I used to take my bike and go riding all day, like leave on a, on a Saturday and wouldn't come home until dusk. And I would go on a certain trail behind Fallbrook School, where I used to live, on my way to Monsterland. And I would go by this particular trail all the time, and it just had this eerie feeling to it. Uh, it had two trees uh, that looked almost like this prehistoric gate. And every time i ride by it, I would pedal a little bit faster. But uh, this one day I decided, you know what, I'm going in there. And so the trail opening had a little bit of an incline, so I had to get off the bike, walk it in, and then got back on the bike and kind of slowly pedaled. And as I'm going down the trail a little bit, I just noticed that there were no bird sounds, there's no animal sounds. You get that feeling, and we've all had it, where you feel like somebody's watching you, and you just know it. That overcame me, a feeling of, fear, like get out. And so as I kept on uh, pedaling, I, I then stopped the bike. I kind of straddled it between my legs and had my feet on the ground. And I just looked forward and I was just waiting, I don't know for what, but I didn't hear anything. It was just very odd, the silence. And then in front of me, the forest erupts. Like the trees start moving, brush, I hear steps that are like almost like an elephant. I could feel the reverberation through the soles of my feet. And I'm just looking straight ahead, but I don't see a thing. Just everything moving right in front of me, but there's, it should be a moose or a deer or something. There's nothing there. And that freaks me out even more, but I can't even you know, move. I'm kind of frozen. And as soon as it kind of stops, I kind of regain my, you know, my wits about me and go, oh my God, you get on the bike and I pedal out of there. I, bike so fast and it freaked me out and I kept on trying to figure out what did I see what did I not see um, and it troubled me for quite a long time and it didn't um, kind of went in the back of my mind until some other events started happening and it brought me back to that moment in that same area of woods where I feel like you know I might have had some strange encounter at that time 
Uh, that really kind of got me really curious about all the stuff in the unknown. So Monster Land, this is a picture of Old Mill Road. This is this, called this the Toot Bridge. It was so small that you, only one car can kind of go through it at a time, so you'd beat before you go through. And um, it was almost like a gateway. You go through this and you go into Monster Land. And that's when things would get kind of weird. Um, it's now been developed pretty heavily where there's houses, there's a super Walmart there. So it's kind of gotten populated a little bit, but like I showed you before on the map, the power lines in Lemister State Forest is close. That it kind of like whatever activity was happening there is happening in Lemister State Forest as well. So in the 50s, there was a guy that was driving down Old Mill Road, and he starts slowing down. He starts seeing something off to the side of the road, standing there. Doesn't know what the heck this thing is. And he witnesses a terrifying monster that's by that bridge. So this is before cell phones. He freaks out. He's looking for the closest place to kind of go and tell somebody what he saw. It's blowing his mind. He finds the only place that's open at that time is a bar. And it's called Twins, which is still in existence today. It's now called Miranda's Pub. Uh, but he goes in there, tells the manager what he's seen. He says, call the cops. you got to call the police. The guy's kind of like, all right. Um, after a while, realizes this guy's really terrified. He's seen something. He calls the police. The guy wait, is waiting around impatiently for a couple of minutes. He's like, I'm going to go back. This thing's going to disappear. Tell him I'm by the bridge. He takes off. Moments later, the cops show up. Manager explains it to him. They take him seriously. They head over to the spot. So they see the man's car off to the side of the road. The lights are on, the engine's idling, and the door's open, but there's no one inside. So they just expect that he's off into the wood line. He's going to come back. He should be out any minute. But he never comes out of the woods. He disappears. So this was the legend of how Monsterland got its name, where people are disappearing. You might have heard of uh, David Polides, who's an author writing a, uh, books about missing 411, about p people missing in state forests. It's almost one of those situations, but when I did do some digging on it, I couldn't find anyone that really disappeared during that time frame. Um, so it could just be that legend. But where Monsterland really gets his name goes back to 1884. The first reported sighting of a Bigfoot was a hunter was out in that same area of woods in Monsterland and saw this creature walking on two legs. And once the creature noticed it was being watched, it saw the, the, the hunter and it dropped down on all fours and took off like a bear. But he physically saw this thing walking on two legs. That same area too, there was another creature walking upright and a local farmer claimed that when he watched this thing, it grabbed one of his cattle, tore it to shreds, stole pigs from. Uh, so they were seeing this, and that's actually how Monsterland got its name. Before it got its name in the 50s, the locals used to call it the UFO landing area. So there's that weird connection between this, this UFOs and Bigfoot in this area as well. So this is about some tracks that were found going back in 2010 that led uh, myself to be on Finding Bigfoot with a friend of mine. There were two hikers. They decided to go for a hike in Lemster State Forest. Nobody was around. They were heading to No Town Reservoir. They came to a fork in the trail. And they both argued, one's going to go this way, we should go this way. The husband won the argument. You know, that never happens. Uh, so they get about 10 minutes, 15 minutes down and realize they're going the wrong way, so they doubled back. So the spot that they came to that fork in the road, there were these six footprints that were in the ground. And I'll show you. This is just a straight line coming out of the woods onto the trail and going back into the woods. They were not huge by any means, about 11 inches, 10 and a half. Uh, but the width was about five inches across. There were vis visible toes. They had heard a grunt sound before they were right in that area on their way. They thought it was a deer. They came back and they see these tracks. Now they're by themselves. The trail itself 
certain areas there's mud and everything else, but it's very rocky. It's not a place where someone would be going running barefoot. So this freaked him out. He picked up a rock, started looking around, felt like they were being watched the entire time when they went on that hike. So that same situation, they didn't hear any birds, they didn't hear any animal sounds, and they encounter this. It takes them twice as long to get out of there because they're just so disheveled. Uh, but then he just sits on this for a couple of days but cannot sleep, does not make any sense. He reaches out to his brother who had talked to me like a week before and we had a discussion about Bigfoot. So that's why he's like, you gotta talk to my friend Ronnie, he's into all this stuff. And so I went back and actually helped relocate those tracks and cast one of the prints. Um, and when I saw these things for the first time, just from all the books that I've read and different famous trackways and, and all those different elements, I could see all those with the, the depth of the print, the stride was about six feet between each step, straight line in an area that's had this history. Um, it just freaked me out. So that's uh, just a snapshot. You can kind of see the, the big toes, the big toe there. I'm always kicking myself that we didn't have more plastering material to get all six. Um, but we had just enough to get one. If we were there maybe five, ten minutes later, there were four-wheelers that were coming down the trail and that they were going to go right over those tracks, so they would have been gone. And there was about ten days between um, my friend finding the tracks, him and his wife, and us going back. So they somewhat stayed intact during the whole time, which blew my mind. Uh, and then if we got there just a little bit later, they would have been gone. We, I wouldn't be here right now. And so one of the things we realized, too, as we laid down this plastering material, that we used too much water. And it wasn't going to dry as, you know, as it needed to. So I remembered um, this journalist, John Green, who was a Canadian journalist that was a skeptic, started researching these types of cases and actually became a believer because of all the physical evidence he's found. He cut out three footprints, just cut the earth out and took the prints out. So that's what we came up with. And we started cutting out this print to get it out of the woods. Um, and that's luckily, I think, what helped us to, to retain this thing, let it dry. David Brake, who's a PhD, works with Homeland Security, was one of the investigators that actually came and researched this case. And that always gets me is when you have a, a PhD, a smart guy, taking this stuff seriously, you should pay attention because there's a reason for that. And he's into microbiology, biology, immunology, so there's, a, there's some interesting uh, connection of why he's doing this. So that led to finding Bigfoot, who they ended up coming out to Lemonster. It's in the big roadie episode, which is all about Rhode Island. And they kind of slid this story in there, act, acting that it was uh, on the border of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, but it was really Lemonster. This is Matt Moneymaker, who's the head of the BFRO. So then we go into some local encounters, because once this story hit, newspapers was on Finding Bigfoot, um, people started talking and coming up and saying, I have a story that I haven't told anybody in 30 years, or I know someone that had an encounter. And that's how this stuff starts steamrolling. And it just gives more validity to my friend's encounter, my encounter that I think I had when I was young. So recently, we can't show it now, but recently there was a video a couple years back of a small Bigfoot type creature, reddish brown, running from a tree. There was a wood knock and this kid had caught on video. There's so many videos out there that can be you know, created as little hoaxes. This one's questionable. Uh, but again, this is in Lincoln Woods in Lemonster. If you guys want to YouTube it, you can check it out. It's a short video, maybe 20 seconds or so, but something runs. I think it's like a little guy in a suit, but this was one of the first stories that came out um, after the story hit the newspapers. Um, there was a, a gentleman who was fishing with his daughter uh, in Crow Hill, which is a part of Lemonster State Forest in Fitchburg. And they see this girl come barreling down the trail on a mountain bike, freaking out, and stops and says, can I ask you guys a question? He's like, yeah. He goes, are there animals in these woods? He's like, yeah. She's like, bears? He's like, yeah, I think so. That run on two legs and are white? He's like, what? She was riding her bike 
on the trail and there was something thrashing through the woods that was paralleling her off to the side, keeping up with her speed. And when she looked over, she said it was a white Bigfoot running on two legs, following her. And when you hear these things, you're like, okay. But this girl said, I'm never coming back here. She threw her bike in the back of the truck and peeled out of the parking lot. So you get to wonder, okay, why would you tell this story to somebody so they can think you're crazy? Is that, is that the intent? Or is this something that really happened to her and it's just so astonishing that she had to tell somebody? 2006, Lemister State Forest, this involved a police officer. I always find these um, encounters interesting because what do they have to gain by making up a story like this? But a police officer was uh, with his buddy, and they were hunting in Lemister State Forest. They split up, and he's walking along the power lines, kind of as they're starting to go up. And off to the tree line, he sees this dark, huge figure come out of the trees, out of the tree line, and walk on the trail going up along the power lines. So he's looking up ahead, and he thinks it's his buddy, and he's going, why is he not wearing his hunter orange? What is he doing way up there? He was back here. All of a sudden, his buddy taps him on the shoulder, and he turns around. He's like, if you're here, who's that? And this thing walks back, goes right back in the tree line, almost like a show. Walking out, here I am, and then go back. And so he didn't tell anybody this story until these stories started coming out. Um, he believes that he did encounter a Bigfoot-type creature in Lemister State Forest. This was a closer encounter, which involved two hunters. You always ask, you know, if there's a Bigfoot, if there's something real, how come hunters don't see it? They do. They don't talk about it. Why would you tell anybody this stuff? Um, these are two hunters that, older gentlemen, they, between the two of them, 80 years of hunting experience in Lemonster, in those woods. And they heard about some of these encounters, and there was an argument with one researcher and one of these guys. They said, listen, I've been hunting in here forever. There's nothing like this. You guys are full of crap. A couple weeks later, he's out hunting with his buddy. They're walking down the trail. This is in the wintertime. And this huge 7-foot, 800-pound Bigfoot creature walks right in front of him. Doesn't look at them, but just walks right in front of them. And they're both like this with their guns. He ended up calling the researcher back the next morning and apologizing. But it was almost as if, oh, you don't believe that we exist? Give us a couple weeks, we'll show you. Apple Hill Farm area in Lemonster is near Massapog Pond in Lunenburg, which has a lot of encounters and sightings. This is also connected to Lemonster State Forest and an area um, that's just seemed to have some other encounters with strange lights as well. But a woman that was living near the apple farm walked out early in the morning to tend to her garden. And um, the same spot is where she heard some weird sounds the night before in the dark, couldn't see anything. But off into the distance, she sees this figure in in her garden off to the off to the distance and she's watching and all of a sudden it stands up on two legs like this and she for a second just ran back in the house got a glimpse of it this tall creature and she ran in this same area is where a lady had uh encountered sounds outside of her house dogs were going nuts she opened the door and there's a bigfoot right in the front her front yard Shuts the door, she's 85 years old, calls her son to come over. He can't find anything, but the next morning there's tracks all around the house. 1995, there were four guys that were fishing out of canoes. As they started getting to a certain section of the pond in the area, what they described as what sounded like a gorilla started shaking the trees and hooting and hollering at them that they just spun around and paddled out of there. This seems to happen a lot. A gentleman that's with the BFRO, um, lives out of Springfield, read, read the book Monsterland and then decided to kind of go to, to uh, Elm Street, which is one of the entrances to the forest that people have a lot of 
uh, encounters. And he went in there. It's a good hour hike just to get to the reservoir itself. And there's a lot of different trails breaking off. But he got to a certain section where he started seeing these weird structures uh, off in the distance. And this was probably about four months ago. As he went off trail and got closer to some of these structures, same thing. He was felt some kind of presence and all of a sudden the trees started shaking and that same gorilla sound like thumping of the chest was heard that he turned around and ran out of there. Same area, there's no camping in Lemster State Forest, especially by No Town Reservoir, it's a, a water source. Uh, but some guys were out riding four-wheelers and decided that they were going to camp out that night. Um, there were probably three or four friends. One of them decided that he's not staying. He left before the sun went down. But all throughout the night, they started having rocks pelted at the tent. And they would come out, look around, can't see anything, see rocks on the ground, go back in, zip up the tent, and then rocks would start getting thrown at him again. They're in the middle of kind of nowhere. So the next morning, they just think it's the, their other friend that left and was kind of trying to scare him. And so they confronted him. He's like, are you kidding me? There's no way you're going to catch me hiking back into the woods and staying there all night. There, this was like 3 to 6 in the morning of rocks being pelted. This is very similar to a lot of stories and encounters of people having rocks thrown at them, never hitting them, but just kind of landing perfectly right by them, almost to like warn them to get out of here. Uh, this was, came over the uh, scanner when someone had called the police and reported a large hairy man crossing the street and they were worried it was going to get hit. Again, you're going to take these with a grain of salt. You know, someone just making a, a false claim and making a call in. Uh, but these things all started kind of happening around the same time of these other sightings. I had a friend that was, uh, when all this kind of came out, was kind of, uh, you know, people are going to bust your stones and make fun of you. Uh, but this guy actually had a weird situation where he went out in the middle of winter. He's going to go get some firewood. And then he noticed these footprints across his yard going, you know, by the fire, uh, firewood, by the trash, and through his neighbor's yard coming from the woods. And there are bare footprints, visible toes. This is not the exact picture, but just an idea of what this would look like in the snow. But he ended up calling me the next day, and the, the area had all melted pretty quickly. Uh, but he was now, this big time skeptic was now a believer that there's something else going on out there. Um, 2011, two hunters were out in Sholin Farms area, which is near the Mass Pog Pog uh, area, and saw two deer carcasses up in the tree. And they're, <laughs> they've never seen anything like this before. We're not supposed to have uh, the mountain lion in Massachusetts. So it could be something like that, but that's not really something that they actually do. Um, so to me, this seems like a lot of other cases where there's like warning signs. Stay out of our area. This is our, our food kind of thing. Um, same situation with another hunter that sets up tree stands and you can kill anything with coyotes, whatever. He's coyote hunting and he's sitting in the tree. Gets quiet. But then all of a sudden he feels like he's getting surrounded from all directions. Just hearing some kind of sounds. Then he starts hearing whistling to him, and he's, he started freaking out. He, he, uh, he's not afraid of anything, and this spooked him so much that he jumped out of the tree stand, left, and just went off running, because what is, that, what is out there whistling, coming close to him, and he's, after hearing all these stories, he felt like he had something that was coming close to him. Uh, this is a, another area. Again, these, all these different spots are all connected. And there's different things that are happening, especially on the Bigfoot side, but also UFOs. But this was a group of kids that are out in the woods, and they saw a figure similar to the cop, um, a dark 
tall figure walking away from them, but heading towards the pond, the swamp. And they called out, like, hey, mister, like, it just seemed out of, out of sorts. The figure did not turn around, just kept on walking towards the swamp, into the swamp. So they took off, um, went to tell their parents. One of the guys went back and kind of went to the area. They couldn't find any footprints. Again, of these kids making this stuff up. Uh, but they said it looked like he was wearing a dark jacket with a hood. But this was in the middle of summer. So it seems like they could have seen something. This is when stuff starts to get weird. Because with Bigfoot, again, you think you're dealing with an animal or a mammal. But there's a paranormal side to it. And um, one of the, the local investigators had a call from a girl that he knew that found this weird single footprint in her driveway. No other tracks, just a footprint. So he was instantly thinking, this is someone just trying to play a joke. Or... Because normally you'd see other footprints, how this, you know, someone take the shoe off and just make a little thing. So we're talking about that, and one of his friends came over as a ghost hunter and broke out all this different equipment. And one of them was this ghost machine or the spirit box where you're able to turn it on and it can translate from different signals almost into vocal different words. So we were just talking about this single print. And as soon as the kid turned this thing on, it says, Bigfoot, footprint, driveway, real, shut it off. <laughs> We shut that thing off, but it just scared us all that we were like, what are we, what are we dealing with here? This is a single print on the right of Mike Patterson. He, uh, if you go on YouTube, look up Sasquatch Ontario. This guy's research is, is pretty amazing. He's actually got an audio of it talking, a Bigfoot talking. Um, he's also had some unbelievable stuff that deals with the paranormal around this. But he's found this single print in the middle of the woods with no other tracks around it, just one footprint. It doesn't make any sense, unless they are something else. So this is when the orange orbs come in too. Now this is fairly new f phenomenon, but it's been going on for a very long time. I've just recently experienced this, and uh, I found it interesting that other researchers that are working in Bigfoot hot spots, have encounters with these things. They are not Chinese lanterns. Everyone will tell you, someone just lit up some Chinese lanterns. They are not them. You can see the, the bag of the lanterns. You can see the wind blowing it around. There's definitely a difference. The best description is they look like these little suns. Like they're made of plasma or some kind of material that they have. They're self-luminescent. Uh, I've seen them. They're about basketball size. And there's some intelligent control behind them. There's, there's, there's a weird connection there. So again, it looks like the sphere. There's been different colors of these things. Uh, people have seen you know, white orbs, but these specific that are kind of this orange, red fire kind of color. They will, I've seen them on occasions where they're following one another, like one is leading the other and they're on some kind of path. Or you'll see one, and then a short time later, maybe five, ten minutes later, another one comes and follows that same path. And they seem to be going in the same direction. But they have also been seen to line up and actually form these weird shapes, like triangles or squares or just straight lines, like the Phoenix Lights. So sometimes there's only one, but sometimes they're seen in two or three of these things flying together. And they're seen all over. There's videos, if you go on YouTube, New Hampshire, California, people seeing these things all over the place. What's interesting is they appear suddenly, and then they disappear just the same. So this was uh, in Mississippi in 2014. Again, this is one of the quote from this guy that had this experience and just thought it was a Chinese lantern at first. And so they just watched across the sky, and as it got to the clouds, it just disappeared. And this happens over and over and over again. And looked at this small dot. Uh, they started laughing about it, whatever, and then five minutes later, here comes another one.
going in the same direction. So this, they all follow this weird pattern. So my first experience with these were, I used to be the director of digital for the Boston Herald. And I was coming home from Boston, going into Lemonster. This was at night, but this is the exact kind of shot of where it was. Off to my left, I saw these two balls of light, one leading the other, flying pretty low, enough that I could see them in my peripheral, and they flew right over my car. As they were flying over, I rolled down the window to see if they were emitting any kind of sound. It was completely silent. But when I looked at these things, you just had that sense that you're seeing something special, something different. It's not, it was not a lantern. It was something I've never seen before. I had no idea what I was looking at. But I watched them fly over my car and then take off. What was interesting is this happened like a week before the Finding Bigfoot episode came out. So there's this weird tie with these things in Bigfoot. But I end up getting home and uh, jump on Facebook and you can see when someone is online, little green dot. I saw my buddy was online and he's kind of interested in the same kind of stuff. I see him post or like different articles around this subject. So something possessed me to just send him a note uh, on Messenger and just tell him what I just saw 15, 20 minutes ago. And um, I start typing, send him a message, said, you're not going to believe what I saw. These two balls of light, orange balls of light, just flew over my car. Uh, and um, I don't know what they were. They were silent. Definitely looked like intelligent, controlled. And I can see him start typing. He's like, dude, you're blowing my mind. He's like, were you at Lemonster Connector about 20 minutes ago? And I was like, yeah. And he tells me he's on the other side of the intersection at the exact same time as I am and sees, the, sees them fly over as well. But what are the odds that I reach out to him to tell him this, and he's seeing the same thing at the same time? Here's the other piece of it. He then tells me, oh, Ronnie, did you know that I'm a UFO investigator? I'm like, what? And he's been doing investigations in New Hampshire area. So there was that Bigfoot, the UFO connection, that weird synchronicity that kind of occurred with that. Like I mentioned, they are, they're seen in these same spots that people see Bigfoot UFOs in the paranormal. So I started digging into what are these things? You know, what did I just encounter? If you go to any of these different reporting sites, look up and see all the recent sightings in the past couple of months and look how many are round, circular shape, orange colored orbs or weird balls of light. There's a ton of them. And they might be named you know, balls of light, fireballs, spheres. They're classified differently. It depends on how people report them, but there's a lot of them. And they all do the same thing. They're all seen silent, flying together, disappearing, appearing in weird spots. And then you can also see people having those sightings in the same time frame in the same areas, too, to corroborate each other. So this is a big mystery that people are trying to understand. Uh, there's researchers out there like Erica Lukes from MUFON and Bob Spearing. Terry Ray wrote the, a great book, which basically just compiled all these different sightings after he had his own encounter in, in uh, Washington, DC. So it's a very interesting piece that we're still just starting to learn about. They've been written about in several other Bigfoot books. This is a, a mom and her daughter who eventually wrote a book. Uh, but her book, Valley of the Skookum, um, deals with her living in the remote wilderness and actually encountering these strange balls of light, these orange orbs, with her family. They also reported UFOs and Bigfoot activity. This one's interesting, too. So now... We see Bigfoots, we see orbs, but then there were two girls that witnessed a seven to eight foot tall Bigfoot, a white Bigfoot, with eyes glowing red watching them play, and it was holding an orb in its hand. So there's that connection, these things, with the Bigfoots. Lemister State Forest decided to do like a night, one of the first night investigations to kind of go to this area. And I was with another researcher, and we started walking down the trail, maybe 150 yards, pitch black, had these crappy flashlights, and you get that feeling that you're being watched again. So we started getting a little freaked out. What are we doing? You know, maybe we should head back to the car. 
Um, so we go back to the car. He's looking for another flashlight. And we end up talking a little bit, and we're just sitting there kind of getting ready to take off. Like, what are we, this is stupid. So he points to Bobcat Mountain off in the distance. And this is in the wintertime, so you can see the outline. So we need to go all the way to the end of that, because no one hikes all the way out there. That's where we'll find some Bigfoot evidence. Maybe, I don't know, three, four minutes. <coughs> this orange ball of light appears in the sky off to the left. Just materializes. And I see it first, and I just turn. And I grab his arm, and I said, what are you seeing right now? He's like, uh, orange orb flying through Bobcat Mountain. I'm like, OK. This thing comes flying in, gets to the edge of the forest, and just as it goes in, it lights up all the trees going through the trees. And we're sitting watching this thing. No noise. It goes right to the spot where he pointed, hovers for a beat, and then shoots down on the ground. And we're both just, all you could hear is us breathing. <laughs> What the heck? We jumped in the car and we took off. We were so freaked out. I was expecting something to come running over the hill. These orbs are not seen just at night. They're seen during the day. The two biggest times of the year, and one of them's coming up soon, so you guys can get your cameras out and binoculars, is New Year's Eve and the 4th of July. And the reason being is we're lighting off fireworks. But more importantly, we're all looking up. We're not looking down on our phones. We're actually looking up at the sky. So a lot of these sightings happen around these days. Are they attracted to the fireworks? Maybe. Um, but I've seen these things during the day uh, at an event that was early dusk where they had a concert. So there's still light in the sky. Watch one orb come in by itself. Everyone's facing this way. I, for some reason, brought my binoculars. Almost expecting something to happen. And uh, we watch this thing almost seemingly go behind some doorway and just disappear. So my friend was, what was that? I go, I don't know, but I guarantee there's probably another one coming. And sure enough, five minutes, here comes another one. So he grabs my binoculars and is watching this thing through the binoculars, goes to the same spot where the other one disappeared and just disappears. And he puts it, he's just looking at me like, what is that? So I explain it to him. Doesn't want to believe me. Next day, post something on Facebook, trying to find out if anyone else has seen these type of things. And someone says, oh yeah, they were lighting off um, lanterns, Chinese lanterns from uh, the Hannaford's parking lot over there. So you go, oh, OK. So you accepted that. And I said, what do you, you saw it with your own eyes with binoculars and watched it. Did you see a bag? Did you see a Chinese lantern? Or did you see a ball of light? I saw a ball of light disappear. <laughs> But it still doesn't make sense. But he's going to accept that other explanation because it goes beyond our, our logic and our understanding. Now, I had the, uh, another friend that staying over his friend's house or his father's house that was by the same area where a lot of stuff happens. <coughs> 4.35 in the morning, opens the door. And there's an orange orb just hovering above the street lamp. And he's just, what the heck? No sound, just hovering there. Watches it, and all of a sudden just shoo, goes straight up into the sky. There's a famous book called Incident at Exeter by John Fuller. And he talks about during this spat of UFO sightings, people were seeing these orange orbs. And a girl recalls a fighter jet chasing one of these orbs, and, she, and it couldn't catch up. So what are these things? The military is aware of them. So much so that they actually flew over Fort Devens in 1952. So there was a, a letter that came out that was written about this encounter where they literally, um, they had a, um, the Air Force Army was still kind of one and they had planes, they had a little airport there. They had these orange orbs fly over the base, one by one. Had no idea what they were. Not only are they seen in Leominster and places like the Bridgewater Triangle and other hot spots, <coughs> excuse me, they seem to follow you. I went to the Cape, this was last, last summer. Some reason expected to see these things, again, and we were the, this is where it all gets kind of weird too, is that 
as we're on vacation at this place, it was 11 o'clock at night, we were the only ones, my wife and I were out on the porch, on the deck, and I'm facing the ocean. She's facing me, we're playing cards, and there's a, maybe 10 or 12 people with a white table off to the side. And there's about, I don't know, 65 units in this whole place. They're the only ones out there, we're the only ones out there. And I had this weird inclination that they are from my area, like they're from Lemonster area. I don't know why, but that thought popped in my head. So then they pick up the table and the chairs and they move close and they move literally right underneath us. And we're on the second floor. I'm like, what the? So we start talking a little bit quieter and just kind of like, why, why are they moving over here? So then I'm looking and all of a sudden I see two orbs flying over the ocean. I'm like, Amy, turn around. Amy, turn around. She's like, no, no, turn around. Ah, oh, son of a... They, you know, they, she just knew that they were going to show up. And so I ran down to go get my binoculars that were in the car and I had to run across the grass. <coughs> and I see, I walk by this table and they're all up watching these two orbs flying and they got cameras and binoculars. So I was like, whoa. And like... These came in last night. We all decided to come out again and try to catch them on camera. So I said, hold on. I just had printed the book. So I ran in my car. I grabbed the binoculars and a book. And I came back and I gave it to one of the guys. And he looks at the cover and it has orbs on it. And he just took off a run. Freaked him out. And I s explained what they are. I go, people are still trying to, we don't know what these things are. Uh, but watch, there's going to be more coming. And then sure enough... Two more came like five minutes later, following that same path. The other piece of it, the kid asked me, where, where is this book? Where are you, guys, where are you focusing on? I'm like, Lemonster. He's like, he goes, I'm from Fitchburg, the next town over. I'm like, what the heck? So there's this weird synchronicity that seems to be a part of all of this as well that tells you that it's just not circumstance. It's almost orchestrated. That gets freaky. I spoke at the New England UFO conference several times and prior to the one last year I was working on what to talk about, um, talking about uh, focusing a little bit more on, on the orange orbs piece. And one of the guys that was with me just said, let's you know, go outside for a second. So we walk outside and this is a picture from my porch view of the sky and this is what we saw. Three orange orbs just hovering in the sky. Right at that time, so I ran in, I grabbed my, my phone, took a video of it. There were about six other witnesses. Unfortunately, with the video, it looks like they're white balls of light, but these things were orange, red, hovering, flying independently, so you can see them kind of going like this. It wasn't wind blowing them all in one direction. And then one by one, it was like a little show for us for two minutes, goes out, goes out, goes out. Massachusetts, one of the biggest states with UFO sightings. And what makes this whole thing interesting is orange orbs, Bigfoot, UFOs, they're all connected somehow, some way. Lemister also has a connection to this lady, Betty Andreessen, who was world famous alien abductee. <coughs> She had her first experience at seven years old, 1944, in Lemonster with this orange marble-sized ball of light that affixed itself to her temple and started, there was telepathic communication saying that she's coming along fine. And now she's had this time, suspension of time with gray aliens and Ashburnham close by. There's been five different books that have been written about her. But what I found interesting was what happened in 1964 in Westminster, which is a couple towns over that also is part of the Lumster State Forest, is this girl woke up middle of the night and there's an orange ball of light hovering outside the window. So she screams. This blue beam of light shoots from the orb and hits her in the head. Her mom comes upstairs and it's Becky Andresian, Betty's daughter who then, after that experience, you know, the orb disappears, but all of a sudden she starts having these strange writing, this ability to write this strange language after that experience. What is going on? 
Lemmis is part of Worcester County. This has been a long history of this whole area. This is, uh, the airship sightings of 1896 and 1897 where people all over the country were seeing these weird cigar-shaped craft. And Worcester, which is 15 minutes away from Lemonster, had its own sighting for a couple of days where people were seeing this, this strange craft. And I cover a little bit of this in, in the book as well. So that's, here's the book. I'm, I have it for sale. I also um, starting a podcast, which is launching in June, where I'm going to be interviewing different researchers and authors from all over the country and the world. Um, I'm also on AF 107.3, which is in mass. You probably don't get it up here, but you can get it streaming. So every third Monday, uh, we're doing Monsterland Monday, and we just talk about current news that's kind of happening on the national scale, but then talking about other encounters that are local as well. But. Anyone have any questions? That's my presentation.